Hello, my name is Marcy Sklo. Welcome to Going Deeper. Today I'm sitting with the Reverend Dr. Andrea Vazian. Andrea is a longtime activist, social justice activist, and a reverend pastor. And her latest big endeavor, very creative endeavor, is the Sojourner Truth School for Social Change Leadership. Perfect. I did that very perfect, well. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> So, we're now embarking on part two of this interview. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. So, um, instead of asking you a question, a question, a question, this is the kind of thing I'd like to cover in the next 30 minutes. I want to really hear a lot about the school. Good. And it is amazing what you all are doing. <sighs> I want to hear also about your work um, regarding being an ally. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I interviewed Urban Staub in the past, mm -hmm. and his work on active bystandership mm -hmm. uh, was resonating for me a little bit in terms of the ally thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then if there's time, uh, a little more about the anti-racism work mm -hmm. that you're doing would be mm -hmm. fine. So I don't know where you want to start with all of that because it kind of all feeds together. It does. Yeah. Shall we start with some comments about the school? Sure. See, and then we can get to allied behavior and allyship. Exactly. Um, I'm delighted that you are a supporter and a fan of the Sojourner Truth School for Social Change Leadership, which we often call the Truth School. Great. And uh, I will tell you how it came into being and how we're doing, Good. briefly. Uh, I, as we talked about in the first half hour, was the pastor of the Haydenville Congregational Church for 12 years and announced my retirement from that church in the summer of 2016 oh. and announced that I would be leaving in 2017 and it was the summer of 2016, and it never occurred to me that Trump would win. Okay. It just didn't occur to me. Yeah. I thought I would move into retirement and paint and write poetry and visit Sasha and yeah. Austin and have a, a nice life. It didn't occur to me that the world was about to shift. Yeah. And then I had announced, and then in November, Trump won the election. Right. And I really became very depressed yeah. and very distressed. And in uh, January of 2017, I made a long train trip for three days to Austin, Texas to mm. see son, my son. And I was really very inside, uh, and as Quakers would say, under the weight of it. Mm. I was under the weight of it. The Trump had won, and I'm a lifelong activist, and I had lost my bully pulpit. I had lost my church oh, and my community. Right and the people with whom I had been so active, and I was very troubled, and I started saying a mantra to God, which was, I am your servant, show me a sign, show mm. me anything I am supposed to do in the Trump years that will make a difference. And it was on the train trip home that I received, or I had the sense or vision or whatever of the Sojourner Truth School for Social Change Leadership, and it literally came to me, and I called Michael, my partner, my husband now, uh, from the train and said, I've had this idea. And he said, run with it. He said, oh, you got zapped again. He calls it when I get zapped. He said, oh, you got zapped again. Um, I didn't have the title then, but I had the idea. Yeah. What we are yeah. is a nonprofit that offers movement building, very concrete skill building, movement building classes in Greenfield, Northampton, East Hampton, Holyoke, and Springfield, all the classes are free mm -hmm. and we pay our trainers. And we use sites that already exist so we have no overhead of a location or an office or a building. Wow. So we use synagogues and church basements, lots of libraries, union halls, uh, GCC, HCC. <laughs> we use any place oh that'll God. have us that's on the uh, bike, a bus route, on a bus route, is wheelchair accessible, sure. doesn't charge us, and welcomes us. And we teach everything from 
how to write an op-ed, how to write a great letter to the editor, how to speak in public, how millennials and elders can organize together, mm -hmm. how we just, how to hold on to hope in hard times, how to sing songs of, of uh, freedom and struggle, how to, we, um, th this is our catalog. Yeah. Yeah. for um, this fall, and it has 56 classes Amazing. in it, 56 classes between September 1 and the end of 2018. Oh my gosh, so that's only like three months. That's right, that's four months, four three months. and a half months, where we have 56 classes. And we, we meet on Tuesday nights, Thursday nights, Saturdays and Sundays. And the um, trainers are diverse. We have a very diverse pool of, of trainers. And a fifth of the classes are in each of the cities. Hmm. What we're finding, Marcy, is that because the classes are free, we're just crossing lines. We're crossing boundaries of people who are middle income, people who are low income, people yeah. who are wealthy. Because we're in three counties, people are crossing county lines. Sure. So people in Greenfield are thinking, I really like that class in East Hampton and are coming. Sure. People in Northampton are going to Springfield. Right. People from Springfield are coming up to Holyoke. We're breaking down silos, and oh we're finding gosh. that at the end of classes, people are taking out their phones and saying, now what's your name again, and putting each other in their phones oh. and saying, I'll be at your rally, now don't forget our fundraiser. Oh That's happening. Goodness. So the network is growing, the movement is building, and the silos are sort of coming down. Wow. It's really a remarkable thing. We have a nonviolent army of volunteers. Yeah. We have a lot of faithful people coming. And we evaluate every class with a very formal evaluation process. Mm -hmm. And people also tell us at the bottom of their evaluation sheets what classes we're not offering that they wish was there. Oh, so then great. we can be very responsive. And so yeah. we've added more on anti-racism. Yeah. We've added more on cross-generational work. We've added more for teens. We've added wow. teen and millennial trainers because people have sure. asked for it. Sure. I also just need to put in a plug because I've uh, started volunteering, haven't yet done a class, but I've started volunteering as a host. And I went and picked up my supplies and I never could imagine how complicated it is to logistically have all these classrooms in all these different places. So. I got a bag with a beautiful logo on it of the, the Truth School and uh, all my supplies. And that was a whole other aspect of creative organization. And you it's know, amazing. What's, what's really coming through is that I'm such a long time anti racism workshop leader and trainer and nonviolent direct action trainer. I've done so many thousands of workshops that yeah. as a trainer, I thought, what do trainers need? What do leaders and teachers need? And I thought, somebody to pamper them. Oh, so we wow. made the host program and you, thank you, Marcy, <laughs> and all these other men and women mm -hmm. get there early, put the chairs in a sure. circle, give everybody a name tag. And frankly, it is logistically complicated. Yeah. We are using places we don't own. So you have right. to get keys right. and show up and turn up the heat and get and lock up. and. So the host program is a huge yeah. hit because the trainers are being pampered. And I was thinking, if there is one person who gets some jolt of inspiration or some training that helps them move forward in making our world a better place, I'm all over setting up chairs and cleaning up the room there and you go. turning down the heat and sweeping there you up go. or whatever there is you go. needed. You know, there it's you go. all part of the work. There you really. go. And we've heard stories already because I had the idea on January 29th, um, 2017, and we opened May 1. We Gosh. opened May 1 and uh, have been running classes ever since. So we've run 168 classes. Oh my God. And we've trained almost 2,000 people. And what we're hearing, Marcy, is that people are coming back to us and saying, I went to the peacekeeper training, and three weeks later, I was a peacekeeper at a march and rally in Springfield. Yeah. I went to Michael Clare's publisher parish, and then I wrote my first op-ed. It's coming out. Oh, We're seeing the results. So quickly. It's so, I've got chills Me right too. now. Because <laughs> people are coming back to us and yeah. saying, you, you taught us about 
effective consensus, consensus decision making. And then I went to my affinity group and taught them. Oh, so we're hearing some yeah, of the feedback and some of the effects. That's amazing. I guess that, um, you know, in every way that you can let more people know about this yeah. is just going to be important. Yes. You know, how to market it in all these different ways. And that's the challenge because young people use uh, social media, sure. so we're trying to use Twitter and Facebook and the things mm -hmm. I don't do. Yeah. But some people in my generation really like a hard copy. Yeah. They go through their little catalog and they circle sure. things they're going to go to. We leave these in bus stations. We leave them in doctor's offices. We leave them in lobbies. We leave them in bathrooms. We leave them in libraries. Yeah. So there are people who are literally picking it up, and there right. are people who are hearing about the school online. And also, I'm imagining, you know, reverends and pastors and rabbis are announcing them. Totally, and putting it in the bulletin. Putting that in the bulletin. In the bulletins and in newsletters. Good, good. Wow. It's, it's so... Um, helpful in hard times to mm -hmm. see that there is something we can do mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so I'm very happy about that thank you for being a host we need oh, you oh sure <laughs> I haven't done it yet but <laughs> I will in a couple like a week Soon. yeah yeah um, so talk about this concept of allyship mm -hmm. mm -hmm. allyness mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and what what that means, I mean, I think whites, also, first of all, I just wanted to comment on your beautiful um, expression of your own, you know, history and your own background, but, like, it's interesting historically when all of these different sects, different cultures, all became white. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, like, M me too, you mm -hmm. know, in different mm -hmm. different ways that in the past we weren't all seen as the privileged mm -hmm. white. Mm -hmm. And now we kind of are mm -hmm. all lumped into that and I, you know, we have to own that. Mm -hmm. And how to talk to white mm -hmm. people, all mm -hmm. the different kinds of white people, mm -hmm. uh, about their privilege and what they can do. Mm -hmm. So say, say well, some more about such, the allyship. That, that's such a great lead-in because Irish, Armenians, Jews, other, er, other people who have not, who have been discriminated against, right. of course, Jews by religion and anti-Semitism. But when you think about people becoming white, we remember that um, race is just a social construct. Exactly. That it has no biology. It has no <clears throat> basis. <clears throat> in anything significant and it's a social construct so for the purpose of exploitation so a privileged group that became white through v v various incarnations over time right. and a group that could be targeted or exploited that there would be a bifurcation and there would be a justification yeah. of that so that um, distortions and lies and histories history was was created Mm -hmm. distorted misinformation, stereotypes and biases, so a group or groups could be exploited mm -hmm. and abused mm -hmm. and oppressed. <clears throat> but it has no basis in anything that is biological, sociological, anthropo anthropological. That's completely gone. That's completely untrue. What I think is significant about allied behavior mm -hmm. is that there are seven or eight forms of systematic oppression in this country by gender, by race, by physical ability, mm -hmm. by religion, by age. There are seven, they're the isms. Mm -hmm. Ageism, anti-Semitism, racism, sexism, homophobia, heterosexism. Those are the isms. And what people tend to do is to identify very strongly with the place where they are targeted. So that, for me, I'm dominant in every area except by gender. So to spend, as we talked about in the first half hour, to spend so many years talking about sexism in the only area where I was oppressed, mm -hmm. missed all the areas where I was dominant. I see. <clears throat> what allied behavior s it does is it flips the script, it changes, it, it shifts the story, and it says all the areas where you're dominant, that's where you need to be active in partnership mm -hmm. and speaking out in the areas where you get unearned advantage. Okay. And I get unearned advantage in six of the seven. Mm -hmm. So as a white, as a heterosexual, as a Christian, as a able-bodied person, mm -hmm. I have 
privilege dripping from me when mm -hmm. I walk in this room, when I drive home to Northampton, when I go to Stop and Shop, any moment when mm -hmm. I read the New York Times, any moment I am over advantaged. And allied behavior says it's in those areas, mm -hmm. whether you're able-bodied or you're Christian or you're uh, uh, a man or, or you're white, it's in those areas that you are called to this wonderful proud identity and the identity is as an ally. Mm -hmm. And the ally role is to see what has been made invisible to us for so long, which is our privilege. Mm -hmm. So that when you ask a white person to notice their privilege all day, it's like asking a fish to notice the water. Uh -huh. What privilege? I'm in it all the time. Okay. But with training yourself to think how we are overly advantaged as whites or as men or as people uh, who are able-bodied or temporarily able-bodied, as we say, tabs, mm -hmm. or that we are able to see that we can speak out, we can notice who's not in the room, we can notice whose voice was silenced, we can notice mm -hmm. who's safe and unsafe, we can, and that we can speak to other people who look like us. Mm -hmm. So Marcy, mm -hmm. you and I would be white allies able to support each other in swimming against the tide mm -hmm. and in being outspoken people whose identity was allied behavior. I actually think that has been the biggest shift in my social activism, huh. to see myself as overly advantaged, hmm. as having unearned advantage. Mm -hmm. It's not because I was so great, so right. smart, or so capable. It's because I was white and middle class and able-bodied, mm -hmm. and that advantages were just opened up before me. It's sure. like I got a leg up everywhere I went. And whether it was housing or college or right. getting a mortgage for our home, people looked at me mm -hmm. and Michael yeah. as a couple and thought, you're just what we had in mind. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very significant that we raise our kids to be allies at an early age. They get it. They can mm -hmm. speak out. They are remarkable. And that we continue to work with people over time so people see their privilege, not just where they're targeted. Mm -hmm. And everyone can be an ally unless you are multiply, 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 multiply targeted. There's some area where people are, have unearned advantage and can be outspoken mm -hmm. as allies. And so that's why I think the concept and the identity and the activism is so important. So can you walk me through an example? I mean, you've been giving some examples, but um, let's take a white, let's take a coal miner <laughs> from Kentucky. We just had this amazing Kentuckians coming to Leverett, and Paula was on my show and talked a lot about that. So let's, let's think about Kentuckians who are in really a bad way because mm -hmm. of the lack of work and, and how things are shifting in the economy. Yet, they do have privilege in, in, so in, how do you move them into this notion? I think we recognize and validate places where people are targeted and you start there. Okay. So you would start with somebody by saying you may be targeted by economic status. Poor people are targeted. They're targeted by classism and that is difficult and presents every day of one's life right. challenges that in some days feel insurmountable. So people may, in using your example, feel targeted by class. They are targeted yeah. because they are poor. They may feel targeted by also that um, there's sort of geographic advantage, that people believe that the stripes of the coasts, that yeah. people are advantaged, and they may feel targeted by regional okay. um, biases and stereotypes. Um, they also, I think everyone can recognize that white people in any setting, whether you're a coal miner or a CEO or in Hollywood or mm -hmm. a nurse or a doctor, white people simply are treated with more respect, mm -hmm. are safer in any interaction with the police, mm -hmm. are underrepresented in, pri in prisons and on death row, that even when one is targeted, one is advantaged if you are white. Yeah. And that to ask people to hold the paradox mm -hmm. and to hold the contradiction, that we are targeted and 
privileged or dominant at the same time. Yeah. And that we have, as Bev Tatum, as Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum would say, we have multiple social identities. Mm -hmm. And to help people see the whole picture yeah. that we are targeted and dominant at the same time. And in the areas that we're targeted, we want people to be our allies. Mm -hmm. Your example, we want people to speak up for economic injustice, right. for the huge gap between the rich and poor. We want our allies who are middle class and upper class to stand with poor people. Right. And in the areas, even when we're targeted, where we have privilege, we want to stand with others who mm. are targeted. So any white coal miner can still be an anti-racist, even though they may be multiply targeted in other ways. Wow. Does that, it's yeah. complex. However, it is a way of thinking and moving through the world. And it is an identity. We want others to stand with us when we're targeted, and we want to stand with others where we have the advantage. Right. Okay. And white is always, 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 always an advantage. Mm -hmm. Bev Tatum and I like to say that when a racist incident happens on a college campus or university yeah. or a school or something, people think, oh my goodness, there's racism here. That's exactly the opposite. Racism is so old, so profound, and so entrenched in America that racism is always present yeah. unless it's removed. Yeah. So unless you have active anti-racist activity, racism has to be removed. Otherwise, it's simply right, right. below the surface and going to rear its ugly head. Which is what we've seen historically in Amherst schools, for Exactly. Sure. Exactly, yeah. precisely. Yeah. You said it precisely. Yeah, I've had a, a few people on the show talking about that. Absolutely. Specifically. I know you have. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so not to digress, but there is this movie that I really like called Pride. Have you seen this no. film? So the film is about these um, LGBT British young people who hear about the Welsh who are striking in their minds. I have seen it. And they Thank decide God. that they want to go and be allies to these Welsh coal miners. And they go there, and at first, the Welsh are really mean to them. Really? And very um, discriminatory. And slowly, slowly, they accept them one of the Welsh men admits he's gay. <laughs> <laughs> and there are these beautiful scenes of these two communities coming together. I did see it. And in and the end, it. they go to a march together. To a pride march. And there's the coal mine. There are the, and there are the gay people. Absolutely. And they're completely, they're hugging. Oh, they're All these together. gay men are wearing pink boas and the right. coal miners. <laughs> and it is because people became real to each other. Right. Because relationships break down biases. Right. Because you can't hold a stereotype when this person is marching with you or lifting your cause. Exactly. So when gay people who are targeted by homophobia and heterosexism, mm -hmm. but are advantaged by class, team up with people who are targeted in other ways, there you have an example yeah. of targeted and dominant, joining forces and becoming a, a voting block and a marching block sure. for change. That, I have seen it, I forgot <laughs> the name. It's so touching in it's the end great, when they're side by side oh, and they're arm in arm. It's a beautiful that's, film. It's, it's like we have an expression in my field yeah. as pastors, that's the inbreaking of the kingdom. Oh. That the kingdom of God has moments when it breaks in oh, I love that. to ordinary life on earth, when yeah. the moments are perfect. When you have a perfect moment, it's yeah. an inbreaking of the kingdom. When justice reigns, when peace is present, when people are safe, when kids are cared for, you'll have a moment that's an inbreaking of the kingdom. The end of that moving, yeah. when they're arm in arm, is yeah. an inbreaking of the kingdom. Yeah. I love that expression because when we're looking for a movie to watch, we usually say we want it to be affirming, but this is much more specific to what we want, which is the inbreaking breaking of, of the, the kingdom. kingdom. Wow. That's that, actually that's a very important concept for me to add to our inter interview Yeah. because I believe it is what we are striving for every minute, that yeah. the inbreaking of the kingdom may be a moment today 
and two minutes tomorrow and an hour next yeah. week and that we are creating the I would say the kingdom of God on earth even if there are just fleeting moments today we are creating the vision we hold of people safe of kids cared for of the yeah. earth honored of justice reigning of peace present that's the kingdom mm. and that we work towards it and walk towards it every right. day all the time and we have experiences of it exactly. that that are y tangible you've had them oh, you've yeah. had them on this show with yeah. people speaking about their lives and visions and work sure yeah yeah it's reminding me a little bit in 12 step work uh, the notion of spiritual awakening yes so the in breaking of the kingdom is kind of like having a spiritual awakening or some sort of a epiphany or an, an enlightened moment mm -hmm. and there are religious leaders who say it's not just something out there that we aspire That's to right. we have those mm -hmm. you know yes. we might have a, a dull period but from time to time or multiple times a day we do have those absolutely and it goes hand in hand with we are the ones we've been waiting for. Mm. We are the leaders we've been waiting for. Yeah. It isn't someday, it's now. Mm. The choices I make we, about the choices we all make about our time, about yeah. our do dollars, about our energy, sure. about our speech, about our activism. Right. We are the ones we've been waiting for to make the change yeah. that is right around the corner and the inbreaking of the kingdom today. Wow. It's a wonderful, wonderful image that, yeah. that, that I love, that I hold on to. Yeah. And a wonderful place to stop yes. our interview. Perfect. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marcy. Mm. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching. Um, I want to do a shout out to Amherst Media. Thank you so much to the interns and the staff and everyone here who makes these shows possible. And also, if you'd like to see any of my shows, you can also go to marcysclove.com to see them there. Okay, thank you. When I was a little boy sitting on my mama's knee, she said, son, let me tell you about that bad.